On the last Sunday of November, we started Advent season with the first Sunday of Advent, and we took the theme, "'Twas a long time before Christmas." And on the second Sunday of Advent, we looked at the theme of "'Twas 15 months before Christmas." And then the third Sunday of Advent, we went to the theme that it was nine months before Christmas. And then we went uh, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, uh, that was just last Sunday, we went to the theme that it was six months before Christmas. And then last Thursday night, it was, twas the night before Christmas. And now we're going to look at the theme, twas days after Christmas. And here's what happened. The days that followed Christmas spread of the gospel began immediately. It says, when the shepherds had gone to see that Joseph and, and Mary and the baby lying in the manger, that then after they saw that, it said, when they had seen him, the baby, just as it was predicted by the angel, wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, they spread the word concerning what was told them about this child. So immediately after visiting the baby Jesus, they went out and told everyone that they came in contact with, the angel appeared to us, and we went, and it was just as he said, because that's what the text says, what had been told about this child. Well, what was it that was told? That he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So they started spreading the message, a Savior has arrived. Somebody's going to rescue us. And that was the beginning of the spread of the gospel. I'm saying all that because Christmas is not the end, it's the beginning. It's the time for us to spread the news. All of us have a neighbor, all of us have co workers, all of us have family members who do not know the Lord. And they're not going to know the Lord unless we spread the news. No one would have known in the region of Bethlehem if they had not spread the news. Well, while they were spreading the news, it said all those who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So if you go to work and you say, you know what? I just got to tell you something. A Savior is born. They're going to be amazed and think, okay, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> of course everybody knows that. We just had Christmas. They were all amazed. They were, they were shocked. These people were saying, wait a minute, an angel appeared to them, and they went, and they found a baby in a manger, and he's supposed to save the world. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard. And that's what people kind of sort of think about you when you start to share your faith. Craziest thing I ever heard. But they were spreading the good news because they were amazed at what was said, it intrigued them, it kind of piqued their interest and provoked them to ask more questions and others to go and see. We go a little bit further and we find that Mary, though, she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She just stuck them deep down inside. It was like she was savoring the moment and she was just in her mind recording everything that was going on and she was placing it in her heart I like the word, she treasured it. This was something most valuable to her. And she was putting it into the baby book of her mind. She treasured it. She treasured it. As they were going to be spreading the, the, the news, the shepherds, it says, they returned. Now, I looked at this, and I, I looked at this return. Did they return back to the manger scene? After they went out and told people, or is she saying, now, oh no, <clears throat> when they left, they returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. While, while they were departing, were they just praising God? It's kind of like after a good Sunday worship, you find yourself all week singing the songs that were sung on Sunday. Am I the only one? How many? How many you find the same way? You just can't get that song out of your head. And you're just singing it. And you're, yeah. When they went away praising God and for all that they had seen, which were just as they had been told by the angel, by the angel. So they spread the word some days after Christmas. And then on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, 
He was named Jesus. Now, according to the law, on the eighth day, in Leviticus chapter 12, on the eighth day, you had to circumcise the child because the child was considered unclean that was not presentable in the temple. That's all the word unclean means, that you could not present that person in the temple. And so he was unclean for seven days, but on the eighth day you would take him in and they would have a circumcision ceremony. And at that day, it appears that they were naming the child. That's when they cemented the name of the child. We saw last time that was true for Zechariah with John the Baptist, and it's true with Jesus. Jesus was named Jesus, which simply means Jehovah saves. The Lord saves. When the angels announce the Savior is born, they name him Jehovah saves. He is the Savior that is the name that had been given them before he had been conceived. You remember in Matthew chapter 1, the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And if you are one of his people because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your sins have been forgiven. They've been taken away. He is your Savior. This was in fulfillment of the law. Third thing that happened some days after Christmas was that the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. They made a journey, and we're believing that they came from the area of Chaldea uh, or Babylon, that region, and they had perhaps been in contact with the, the works of Daniel, and, and Daniel, who had, works well, uh, had, had a Jewish background and risen in, in, in captivity to a powerful position, he was among the magi in his day, um, the magicians, the soothsayers, and all the wise men uh, of that time. And, and he was in that group, and, and perhaps he is the one that introduced them to Numbers, where it talks, in the book of Numbers, where it talks about a star will rise out of Jacob, so that they were looking for the star, and all of a sudden, what we call the Christmas star, it appears, and they know what to do. They know that a ruler has arisen in Jerusalem. And so they start to make their way. And when they get to Jerusalem, they come to, to the city itself because it's the capital of Israel, and that's where a king would be born. And they go to Herod, and Herod is not a legitimate king of Israel. Uh, he's an Idumean. He, he is not Jewish at all. And, and he's reigning. They come into his presence, and they say, where is he that's been born king of the Jews? He doesn't know. So he asks the priests, the scribes, and all the learned scholars, uh, where will a king be born? And they tell, well, it says in, in, in the book of Micah that he'll be born in Jerusalem, or in Bethlehem. And so he says, well, go and find him, and when you have found the child, come back and report to me, and then I will go and worship him too, all the time knowing that's not his intention at all. And so said, when they saw the star again, they were overjoyed because now that star led them to wherever Jesus was. Some think he's still in Bethlehem. Others think that he's already returned to Nazareth. There is nothing indicating how much time took place after the birth of Christ that the Magi made their appearance. So it appears from the context, because they're going to leave later from Nazareth, that he, he goes up to Nazareth. And there in Nazareth, uh, they are overjoyed because they found the child. And on coming to the house, they're no longer in the manger scene, they're in the house, they opened up their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. A huge part of worship is offering to the Lord. They didn't come empty-handed. They didn't come to worship empty-handed. They had a gift in hand. And they opened up their treasures, their gifts, to the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and they honor him and they worshiped him. They worshiped him. And so we have the worship of the king some days after Christmas. Because the Magi did not go back to Herod, and let him know that he was born in Bethlehem. The, the, the Magi are told by God to go home a different way. Herod is figuring, hey, they're not coming back. So he makes a decree. He figures out the time going backwards to the time when they first arrived that the child was born and calculating it. And just to make sure, 
He sends out a decree that the kids are to be slaughtered. But an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. They call this the flight to Egypt because the angel tells him, get up, take the child and the mother, escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you Herod is going, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. And so he is warned and he arises immediately and he takes the child and they go down to Egypt. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the, the Magi, he was furious. And he gave the orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem, two years old and under. He just wanted to make sure, if this was recent, with even in the last six months, I'm going to make sure I really got them. And so he sends in his soldiers, they go in, and they're slaughtering all the male children, two years old and younger, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi what had done. Sometime after that, Joseph has led his family with Mary and baby Jesus down into Egypt. I find this so fascinating. Because in the Bible, as this text here says, out of Egypt I called my son. It had been prophesied that the Messiah would be called out of Egypt. The same Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. So how is this all going to happen? Well, a census by Caesar was put into place so that they had to go to Bethlehem. You see, they live in Nazareth. So they had to make their journey down to Bethlehem, and that's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. In order for them to be called out of Egypt, he had to get to Egypt. How does he get to Egypt? There is this crazy King Herod who is out slaughtering all the children, and he's warned, you've got to get out of here. And so they flee down to Egypt, which is no longer under Herod's jurisdiction, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled that the Lord had said, out of Egypt I have called my son. You see, they fled from Nazareth down into Egypt. Once Herod died, then they made their way back. So my son was called out of Egypt. This happened after, after Christmas. Then we're told that in Nazareth, the child grew, and they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. I often ask uh, uh, people, uh, do you think that, I mean, what it would be like to have a perfect child? Your child is always right. You are always <clears throat> the wrong one when there's a problem. That might have been tough as a parent to have the perfect child. Now, I often say that, you know, my mom, she had perfection and then made a mistake with my younger brother. But that's not true at all. I am a sinner, but he was sinless. Now, being sinless does not mean that he didn't mature. So I often ask, you suppose when Jesus was in the carpenter shop with Joseph and they were hammering, you think maybe he might have ever smashed his thumb with the hammer? Well, he's a perfect child. And some people would say, no, he could have never smashed his thumb. But it says he was maturing, he was growing. Do you think when Jesus was learning as a baby to crawl, uh, then to walk, you think he ever fell down and bumped and skinned his knee? Of course he did. Being human is quite different from being sinful. When Adam was created originally, he was created perfect, sinless, had no sin. Adam would have grown too. He would have begun to age. He would have done everything that we do. You know, if he smashed his hand on a tree or, or fell down, it would have hurt. That's all being human. That's not being sinful. So Jesus in the carpenter shop as a boy and whacks his thumb and, oh, that hurts. But he didn't curse. Oh, you say, well, that's a little different. You see, when I curse, now I'm a sinner. And I take the name of the Lord in vain, oh, and I just put out a good one. Sinner. Jesus, as a child, learned to walk. He learned to talk. 
in every way that we are human apart from sin. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4. He was tempted in all points like you and I, but apart from sin. The word apart from sin indicates it's apart from a sinful nature. There was no evil impulse within to respond to any of the difficulties of growing and maturing. It says he grew and became strong. There's nothing sinful about being weak. Did you know that? How we respond to that when you're weak. How you respond to that could be very sinful. But there's nothing sinful about it. The child grew and he became strong and he was filled with wisdom. Some people say that Solomon was the wisest man in the Bible. I think we need to correct that. Jesus was the wisest man in the Bible. And so often I'll say uh, Solomon was the second wisest man in the Bible. <laughs> and just to make sure that we're clear on that. But Jesus was filled with wisdom. Which means he knew exactly how to use the knowledge that he had all for the glory of God. So even as a boy with limited knowledge, because he's growing as a boy, he's maturing and he's growing, he knew how to use the knowledge that he had all for the glory of God. This was one special child. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. God was giving him and giving to him and giving to him. Just like God is gracious to us, he was to this child. He was to this child. The next thing I notice in the text is that the worship of the child himself took some place after Christmas. Every year, his parents went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. There could be a whole sermon just out of that phrase just alone. You see, the Passover goes all the way back to the book of Exodus, when God had done the ten plagues upon Egypt because they would not free the people from their slavery. And the last of those plagues was God was going to slay the firstborn son of everyone in the land, except if you applied blood on the, the doorposts of your home and on the lentil over it. And if you put that blood, the death angel would pass over your home. And so they had a special meal that they ate, and they applied the blood on the door. And every year since then, they were celebrating the Passover. And because they had a Passover lamb, and the Bible calls Jesus the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, so that in the book of 1 Corinthians, it calls Jesus our Passover. There's so much here. Jesus is going up to celebrate the Passover, and everything about the Passover speaks of him. Every year they took him up to the Passover. And so on the 12th year when they took him up on the Passover... They went up to the feast according to their custom. Every, they made their journey because it was required for males to go to Jerusalem uh, for the feast of the Passover. And so as a good Jewish son, he goes up to the Passover. And at the, after the feast was over, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But Joseph and Mary were unaware of it. This is a very interesting passage because it talks a little bit about the parenting skills of Joseph and Mary. <laughs> They were not perfect parents, and neither are you. <laughs> Every now and then, you need to admit that, even to your children, and say, you know, I'm sorry, I blew it, so that your children know that you are not perfect too. And that means they don't have to be perfect. We are all just forgiven. Anyway, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. They were thinking that he was with their company. You usually, when you would go up to, to Jerusalem uh, for the Passover, you went with a group of people. Sometimes it was your family members, maybe close friends, and you would go up together. It's kind of like when we have a fellowship dinner here. We tend to gravitate to sit around the table of certain people that we kind of like to hang with, even in the Christian community. And, and that's what they were doing. And so the people had traveled up together. They celebrated the Passover together. And now they're going back. And Mary and Joseph, you see, they, the days were not like ours where there's a threat that if you take your eye off your kid for a minute, you'll lose your kid. I, I can remember when I was growing up, my mom would pull into the supermarket, and there was, you know, my, my younger brother and I usually, because sometimes my older brother too, the three of us in the car, and she'd say, 
You wait in the car while I run into the store. Nobody does that anymore, do they? Well, back in that day, they just assumed Jesus. It was, it was a much safer day. They just assumed Jesus is with somebody else in the group and may make their way. They're thinking that he was in their company and they traveled on for a day. All day long they went without seeing Jesus. Why? Jesus is the perfect kid. Jesus never gets in trouble. Why? We don't have to keep an eye on him like, you know, the other people down the street. You know, that other Joseph and that, you know, Joseph and, and Ruth down the street, that, you know, they have a kid. Their kid's a monster. But Jesus, you never have to watch Jesus. So Jesus is lost in the shuffle. They travel for a day. And then they start looking for him. They can't find Jesus. So when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem. Okay, if they travel a day, they go back for a day. They can't find Jesus. You know what happens to Mary at this point? Her heart, remember she pondered and she treasured everything in her heart, okay? She's panicked. Where is Jesus? God gave me the Savior of the world and I lost him? Are you kidding me? She is panicked. She's panicked. After three days, they found him. So there's the day out, the day back, day hunting. After, so it's on the fourth day, they have, they have no Jesus. Can you imagine their prayers that night? Oh, Lord, I don't know what I've done with your son. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, the scholars. Now, you've you got to realize, in the temple court, this is like seminary. This is where they have the brightest, the most scholarly of the rabbis and teachers and priests and scribes, and Jesus is like in seminary as a prodigy child teaching the teachers. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Asking them questions. Some time ago, I was on a, an ordination council and I was picked as moderator. And as moderator, we were going through all the questions. And then it came time for the hard questions. And then I gave one that's a real doozy. It's a setup question that almost no, there's no win answer on this one. And, and so I, and I tend to do that just, you know, just to see the response. And uh, later, the mother of the candidate came to me and said, some time later, said, I remember you. You're the one who asked the hard questions. Jesus, 12-year-old boy, is asking the provoking questions of the scholars. Do you know who this is? This is the Son of God. He is a divine person with a human nature and a divine nature. And that one person operates in both realms. So in his divine nature, he performs miracles. In his human nature, he gets tired and weak. He has to eat. As a divine nature, he is omnipotent. He has no need for food. He's strong. This is the theanthropic person. This is the God-man. This is Jesus who is the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, John says. There he is as a boy, 12 years old asking questions, and everyone who heard him was amazed. We might put it this way. They were totally floored. The things that were coming out of his mouth and his understanding, listen to this, and his answers. If he is giving answers, they are making the questions. And they're asking him questions, and they probably started pretty simple, you know, Sunday school questions, and then, they, oh, this kid knows something. They keep graduating, graduating. Then they get to the point where now they're asking the questions they don't have the answers to. And so they're posing questions to Jesus, hoping that this little 12-year-old kid will be able to give them the answers to their theological dilemmas that they can't figure out. Isn't this amazing? Jesus, the Son of God, 12 years old, in the temple. 
And when his parents saw him, they finally, they go into the temple. And they finally saw him, they were astonished at him. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? You know what we call this? Blame shifting. Jesus, it's your fault. It wasn't Jesus' fault. He's not the parent, he's the kid. Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Well, here's the problem. They've become anxious. They've become worried. Jesus will later teach. Don't worry about anything. There's enough difficulty today. Don't worry about tomorrow. There's enough difficulty today. The Apostle Paul say, be anxious for nothing. The problem here isn't on Jesus' end, it's on his parents' end. He's there worshiping, he's there teaching, he's there instructing, he's there answering questions. And his mom, she said, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you for three days. He tries to blame it all on Jesus. But Jesus is not the sinner that they were. Jesus' response is so simple. Why were you searching for me? It's a good question. He asked, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Now, I, I checked my Greek New Testament on this because King James Version says, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? That's a big difference. And so then I checked my Greek Testament, and literally the house is not there and business is not there. It literally reads like this. Didn't you know I had to be in the things of my father? And so to make that sense in our English, they put in business or house. But you know what he's really saying? You should always look for me doing the things that my father in heaven wants me to do. And so modern translation have taken that because he was in the temple. He was about the things of the temple. Didn't you know I, should, I would be in my father's house? Jesus, at 12 years old, was focused on one thing, doing the things that God the Father wanted him to do. This is one special child. Very, very special child. Very special child. It even gets more interesting because then we have the obedience of Jesus to his parents. But when it says they didn't understand what he was saying, must I not be about my father's things? Mary, I think, pondered in her heart, God is his father, but Joseph is, you know, the stepfather, the adoptive father. He's not the real biological father, he's, a, he's the stepfather. And so Joseph has got to be feeling a little bit like, ooh, who am I then if you're about somebody else's things, not my things? And he said, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And then he went down to Nazareth with them, and I love this phrase, and was obedient to them. Jesus yielded to his imperfect parents. Wow. Jesus submitted himself to his imperfect parents. Wow. Now, let's think for a moment. Jesus is God come in the flesh. This is God embodied in a human body with a human nature. It is God, and he's got these imperfect parents that he is yielding to. You they are, not the creator. they are not the greatest in any sense or way. But the greatest, most high, almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God puts himself under their authority. I'm saying all that because when the scriptures tell us to submit to governments as imperfect as they are, we have to put ourselves under their authority. When the Bible tells one spouse, a wife, to place herself under the authority of her husband and submit, we have the perfect example. Almighty God the Creator put himself under the authority of Joseph and Mary and submitted and obeyed and obeyed. He was obedient to them. And here's that phrase again. But his mother treasured 
all these things in her heart. Wow. You know what goes in the baby book there? My perfect child, who is God in the flesh, obeyed me. Who am I that he would listen to me? You know, we, have, we, we should have that sense about us. When the prophet prophesied to King David that God was going to elevate him and his family and his throne and his dominion forever, David's response was, who am I and what is my house that you should treat me like this? Listen. When you go into the presence of God in prayer and you pray and you ask him, most of that's what we do, we mostly ask, we forget about you know, confessing, we forget about praising and adoring, we forget about, you know, mediating or interceding. All we do is we give them our request. We go into what we want. And when God answers that, think about this for a moment. The Almighty Creator puts Himself underneath you to give you what you want. You, is that, does that blow your mind? Doesn't that blow your mind? Whew. And Jesus grew in wisdom. We come back to that. Jesus is, they want us to get the picture here that human Jesus is growing and maturing like every other person on the planet. He is, whatever could be said of, of humanity and human nature can be said of Jesus except he did not have a fallen, sinful nature. He was born of the Virgin Mary, so in that virgin birth, he was kept from the, the pollution of sin, so that when he was born, he was born wholly, totally, absolutely set apart from, from sin by God, so that when he was born, he was like the second Adam. That's what Paul will call him in the Corinthians, chapter 15. The first Adam was absolutely perfect until the day he sinned, and the whole race, because we're all in, in Adam. Every single one of us come out of Adam. When Adam fell, his whole posterity, every, every one of us. As Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Likewise, as in Adam all die, all in Christ will be made alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus the Son of God, was growing in his human nature. And watch this. In stature and, he's growing height. And in favor with God. The Father just loved the Son. This is my Son. This is my Son. Wow. I love my Son. And with men. You know what? As holy as Jesus was, people liked him. He was not self-righteous. People felt comfortable around him. This is going to go on through his whole life. You know, the only ones that didn't feel comfortable around Jesus were the religious people. Isn't that funny? The sinners, the tax collectors, the adulterers, the harlots, you name it. You go down the list. The vilest of sinners, the embezzlers, the, you name it. They were comfortable with Jesus. Anytime you're Religion makes people uncomfortable with you. You're really not like Jesus. In all of his holiness and righteousness and goodness, his mercy, all, all, all of that, he never made the people feel uncomfortable. He had favor with men. The tenth thing that I pick up on here is in the third chapter of Luke, verse 21 it says, Jesus was baptized too. <laughs> I like that too. You see, John the Baptist is now in his ministry. You know, we're going to find that this is about 30 years later. John the Baptist is in his ministry. He's preaching and he's telling people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Because the king is present. He doesn't know who it is yet. We find in John chapter 1 that eventually he discovers it's his cousin Jesus. And, but in this passage it says, Jesus was baptized too. Now Jesus didn't need to repent. In fact, when it's asked, why did he get baptized? It was to fulfill all righteousness. 
It was the right thing to do to identify with the people of John who were repenting for their sins because he was the Savior who would take away their sins. So he went down and he was baptized by John. And it says, and as he was praying, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily in the form of a dove. This is a pneumophony. There's things called theophany. That's the... Well, when God makes his presence known. A pneumophany is when the Holy Spirit makes his presence known. And there's an incarnation. The Trinity is here. Watch. And the Holy Spirit descended on, on him in the form of a dove. And a voice came from heaven. That's God the Father's voice. That's the theophany. And he said, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Wow. Wow. Most theologians believe John the Baptist was actually, in a real sense, anointing him through his baptism for his ministry. Because after this baptism, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted of the devil, and then he enters into a preaching mission, re pre preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we begin his th three-year ministry. See here it says in the very next verse, and now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. As I explained the other night, about means, if he hadn't put about and he said Jesus was 30 years old, it would have meant it was his birthday. Because that's the day when you're actually that many years old. But if it was the day before, after, or any time in between those, it was about. And so he was about 30 years old in his ministry. So he was in his 30th year of ministry. So, do, so what do we take away from all of this? It was the days after Christmas. What do we take away? Well, like Mary, I think that we should do what she did. Let's treasure Jesus in our hearts. Come on, folks, we, we, we got to. We got to treasure this in our heart. We've got to memorize scripture, memorize those things that he speaks to us, and, and treasure and put them in our heart. Like the shepherds, we need to be spreading the good news. I've got to be a voice for, for Christ. I've got to tell people about Jesus. I can't hide. I can't stuff it. I, I've got to share it. Like the Magi, I, I need to worship Jesus as king. They went to great lengths to worship Jesus. They went a long way. It's so easy in our comfortable society in which we live to only be convenient Christians. It was not convenient for them. It should not just only be when it's convenient for me. Worship him. Worship him. And like Joseph, we need to heed God's warning. Joseph warned him that there are consequences. If you don't flee, Herod's coming for the child. And so he heeded God's warning. The Bible is full of warnings for us. We just need to heed them. <laughs> like the boy Jesus. Let's be about our father's things. You know what thing he wants you to do. We need to be about our Father's things. And like an adult Jesus, let's commit to a ministry. Once he publicly identified with John, John was preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, he picked up, identified with that, and he began his ministry. We need to each individually lock into a ministry. Even if it's like the prophetess Anna who uh, devoted herself to prayer. That was her ministry. She prayed, she prayed, she prayed, she prayed. Let's commit ourselves to ministry and let's pray. Father in heaven, this is the wonderful story of the things that took place after Christmas Day. So many truths here to learn from, Lord. We pray, Father, that uh, we would spread the news, we would treasure Jesus in our heart. All these items, Lord, that we would find a ministry, get involved in it, and stick with it to the end. Lord, that we would worship you and worship you with uh, wherewithal with what we have as they brought their gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that we would bring you our gifts of ourself, our money, our time, our talents. Lord, I just pray that we will learn that Christmas was not the end of the story, but the beginning. May it be for us. 
May this Christmas not be the end, but the start, even in a whole new year. I pray this in Christ's name.